This is Founder Forward, the podcast from NEA, where we explore the company building journey with candid commentary from founders and investors. Some legendary, some just getting started, all moving forward. I'm Kate Barrett. On this episode of Founder Forward, I spoke to Pamela Valdez, CEO and co-founder of Beak, the leading audio subscription platform for Spanish content and creators. We discussed Pamela's path to founding a company, how she got the attention of Silicon Valley, and the impact she believes Beak can have on an underserved market. I'm Pamela Valdez, CEO and co-founder of Beak. And on every episode of Founder Forward, we like to fast forward to get some insights from a founder and investor who've walked this road together before. Today, we'll hear from David Rogier, CEO and founder of Masterclass, an online education platform that allows anyone to learn from the world's best instructors and NEA general partner, Rick Yang. I'm David Rogier. I'm the CEO and founder of Masterclass. I'm Rick Yang. I'm a general partner at NEA, and I head up our consumer investing practice and led the Masterclass Series B and have been on the board ever since. They talked about David's lifelong attraction to entrepreneurship, stepping outside of his comfort zone to pursue a passion, and his experience taking Masterclass from a big idea to a big business. Whether you're already on the path as a startup founder or wondering how to transform your own passion into a product or service people love, join us to learn how these founders are leaning into their strengths and testing their limits to create something incredibly powerful. Let's dive in. I want to start just talking about like what is Beak and, and tell me a little bit about what you're building. Beak is the number one most downloaded audiobook app for Spanish speakers, but we're actually way more than an audiobook platform. We started with audiobooks, but we have turned into a platform where creators monetize audio content and listeners find the best content from their favorite creators in the audio format. Super interesting evolution, and we'll we'll talk about that, but let's focus on the beginning of the company for a minute. You had the idea for Beak when you were still in college. Is, is that right? Were you always drawn to entrepreneurship? Yeah, so it's kind of a weird story. I would say that I always had an itch to do something big. I wasn't sure if that was going to be a company, but I had this itch of doing something really big because that was the story that I was told from my parents. So when I was in elementary school, I was like very bullied And my parents always told me that being bullied and being different was a good thing because people who change the world are the ones who don't just adapt to the way things are. They are actually, they don't fit in, they stand out. Yeah, it's fascinating. I, I think a lot of entrepreneurs have that idea where they they know they want to build something big. You hit on yours pretty early. I think for David, it was a longer journey to figure out exactly what he wanted to build. Why don't you talk a little bit about just the founding of, of Masterclass, and then we can kind of pick up right where I met you back in 2014, probably. Okay, so I was working for Michael Deering, who runs a venture capital firm in the Bay. And honestly, I was working with entrepreneurs all day, and I missed it. And I was spending more and more of my time spending time with the entrepreneurs and less less and less time on pitches and deciding what to invest in. And I think I went to Michael and I was like, hey, I want to go start something. And that was a scary, hard thing to say and do because I had a great job and I wasn't sure how he was going to respond. And Michael basically said, great, well, what are you going to start? And I was like, I have no idea. <laughs> and, you know, and he's, you know, I surprised like, are you sure this is what you want to do? I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure. And I think he said, hey, you know, you can think about it if you want a little bit. So I was like, all right. So I thought about it for a day or two. And I came back, I was like, no, no, I do. You know, you hear a lot about people like starting companies with a very specific idea or mission in mind. You don't hear as often about people saying like, hey, I want to start a company and I have no idea what that might be. What were you thinking at the time? I was terrified. I was 
I think I had known for a long time. I mean, even when I was a kid, I remember like in when I was like in third grade, I would like take a walk and picture if I started like my own startup, what the office was going to look like and like stuff that has nothing to do with the success of the company, but like starting to do that. And so I think I knew I always wanted to do it, but I think I was probably scared, to be honest. So much of our society, I think, trains us to seek praise. And usually I think how you get praise in our society is you do what somebody else thinks is right or what somebody else thinks is a good idea or what somebody else wants. And I mean, we're talking about grades, right, in school, what your boss wants, what your parents might want or something like this. And starting a company is terrifying for a whole host of reasons. But one of it, at your core, when you start a company, you're doing a thing that most people think is a dumb idea. Because if other people thought it was a good idea, they would already do it. And I was scared. And how long did you kind of live in that zone of trying to figure out what you actually wanted to build? I mean, honestly, it took me about a year. And that was probably one of the darkest times of my life. Now, you might say, hey, how's that a dark time? You have funding. You can do whatever you want. But I think we need constraints sometimes to feel inspired. And it was a completely unstructured day. And honestly, it was self-imposed pressure. I didn't want to mess this up. I got advice from somebody. And she said, choose an idea that even if it fails, you are going to be proud of it. That was amazing advice. Because all of a sudden, I mean, I was trying to look at ideas from the top down, from the bottoms up, from my own need, from my own expertise, all that. And all of a sudden, that was a constraint, right? That was a constraint to choose something that, like, I actually really care about. And so for me, then I knew it was going to be health or education. I posted ads on Craigslist up and down the coast in California, offering to pay people a couple bucks just to hear about their education because I wanted to get ideas of people not for me. And then... I also started thinking about if something failed, what would I be proud of? And there's something about making it possible for anybody to learn from the best. And if I could do that, I'd be proud of it. Something other people couldn't take away. And I got to figure out all the rest. And it took another six, eight months to get the biggest names in the world to say yes to this. And lots of people told me this idea was never going to work. It's going to fail. It's impossible. But then we got our first yes. And then we got our second yes. And then we got our third yes. It's really interesting. I mean, David was able to move forward by framing the challenge a certain way, right? And to do something that he would be proud of. Pamela, was there something in the earliest stages of your journey, a purpose or a guiding principle that that really helped you stay on track? I feel like it was kind of like a way to deal with pain. Like the pain of not fitting in was like, I'm going to do something big. I'm going to do something big. And later on, when I was trying to figure out what that big thing was going to be, I found that starting a company was the most efficient way to do something big, right? And I realized that the stories you grow up with are very important in defining your future. So for me, it became very clear that if Latin America, because I am Mexican, I am from Latin America, if people don't grow up with better stories, we're always going to be a third world country. Latin America is always going to be a third world region. So when I wanted to solve that problem, like getting better stories in the minds of Latinos, you can do it through a nonprofit and try to like get people to read more. Or you can build a business model that actually, in a very capitalist mindset, actually solves the root cause of the problem in a more sustainable way. So that's kind of how my journey started. I was like, I want to solve this problem. And I just figured that building a company was the best way to solve that problem. And how is that going so far? I mean, is is what you're building having the impact you've desired on your target market? A hundred percent. So the way I came up with the solution was what we need is the best possible product for Latinos to listen to relevant information. And the way to do it is to build the best revenue model for the creators that Latinos are interested in. And the problem is like the product like a physical book doesn't work for Latinos, right? Because Latinos are very busy. They are like the longest working hours in the world and they spend most time in traffic than any other region in the world. Most hours spent commuting than any other region. So if you want to solve that, you need to build a company that creates a product that is better for Latinos than a physical book. And that's audio. But the way you get the supply of audio 
is to creating the best business model so that Latino creators and Latino authors can make a living from creating that content. Because today, no one makes a living from writing books in Latin America. Very few people can. But if you create a revenue model where you're incentivizing creators to launch content and it's efficient for listeners, that's how you sustainably solve the problem long term. If you're just doing campaigns with like good intentions to help people get good information, that doesn't sustain long term. Striking that balance between the long term mission and all of the things you have to do to get there is really hard, but it's also really powerful if you get it right. In fact, Rick was telling David that that's one of the things that really compelled NEA to invest in Masterclass. I would say that sort of that drive and that passion and that mission behind why you wanted to start this company and why you wanted this company to succeed actually was one of those things that got over the hump of not having that prior experience in the space. I'd love to actually just take a step back and kind of Get your take on if you're talking to somebody who's got a great job, a great career path, but they're not, you know, they still have that entrepreneurial itch like you had. They don't have an idea. They don't know what they necessarily want to do other than, hey, I feel like I I really want to start a company. What advice would you give them? What drives me, and you got to find what drives you, is I don't want to be on my deathbed in hopefully a long time and wish I had done things I had not done. You got to figure out if those one of those things that you are going to regret and you got to find a way to do it. Now, there are smart ways to do it, too. If you have a family and kids that are depending on you, find a way to do it outside of work. Right. Or find a way if you can become an EIR at a VC fund. So find a way that isn't going to risk the health of your family. Number two is I think one thing I learned was you can test a lot of your ideas for really cheap. So, for example, the Craigslist thing I mentioned, you know, I put an ad on Craigslist wanting to talk to people about their education. Once I then had an idea, I mocked stuff up. So like like one page, it wasn't a web page that actually worked, right? It was like a JPEG. And I put it in front of those same people. So I called them back up, said, can I show you something? And you show them, look, here's an idea for a website, right? And you have classes from these amazing people and had a, a price on it. Tell me what your thoughts are. Usually everybody will be like, Great idea. So amazing. So what I learned you have to ask is, would you pay for it today? Like, can I have your money to have a pre-order? Most of the time at that point, folks will be like, no, I, I think it's missing a couple of things I'd want. But if you start getting people to say yes, then you know, oh my God, I actually have an idea. Um, so I think figuring out what are the cheap ways to test and to try your stuff so that when you have to make that jump, you know it's like kind of the best jump you can. And I think something else I learned in that process was investors love that, right? So if you can show them and do it, because I think it shows them, hey, this is somebody who's not going to spend a lot of cash or is going to be really smart about it. Or I don't know, Rick, I mean, I'll ask you, I showed you and talked to you about some of that stuff because we didn't have a lot of stats at the time, right? Did any of that help or is that just in my mind that that helped investors? It helped. I mean, I would say the process and sort of the hustle around gathering that data and how analytical you and the early, early team were around being very data-led in what to build, what was working, what wasn't working. It showed a bit of early product market fit, but I think what was more important about that was sort of the process of getting to figuring out how you could get to product market fit, right? It wasn't one of these things where it was like, we're just going to throw a bunch of stuff at the wall and see what works. It was like a very methodical way of saying, we need to figure out with a very, uh, with two tenants, right? One is the customer. What does the customer want? You know, what is the value we're bringing to the customer that will bring them enough perceived value that they're going to part with their hard-earned money? And two is like, what does the data tell us? And how do we gather data along every single step of the way? And that was actually a really important part of our investment decision early on. So I think that's a challenge every entrepreneur faces, right? You figure out what you want to do, and then you have to figure out how to do it. Pamela, once you knew what you wanted to build, what steps did you take to make it happen? There are three things that really matter. One is product market fit. It's like you make something people want. The other one is product channel fit, which is you do it in a way that you can leverage a channel to grow your users at the pace that you need to grow to be a venture-backed company and to achieve your mission. And then the third one is like revenue model fit. 
So I needed to get the three right very early. So what we did was we realized that the initial product that we built wouldn't translate into revenue. So we like completely pivoted and we were like, okay, this community where you can actually buy audiobooks a la carte doesn't really work. We need to shift the entire business model. So we went back to the drawing board and we asked users who weren't buying why they weren't buying. And we realized that they were pretty educated by Netflix that if you want digital, it's a subscription. So we pivoted into a subscription model and that's how we got the revenue model fit. So we were actually like, oh, we made something people want. Now we have a revenue model, but then we were missing the channel fit. Like how do we adapt this into a channel that allows us to grow? So something that I learned from these mentors from Silicon Valley is that all products are built in the backs of another channel. For us, we realized that our channel could be creators, and that's how we built it. We created this program where creators would monetize audio content on our platform. We didn't have to spend millions of dollars on paid marketing to acquire the listeners. It was the creators. So we created a better model that is a marketplace that you basically become the super app of all those verticals, but all into one in a way more efficient way because you have network effects between the creators and the listeners. So I'm guessing that all of those advisors you had and people helping you build along the way is part of the reason you were able to be as nimble as you were as the company evolved and and respond to what you were seeing in the market I think for David, it's been a very similar theme in his journey, that leaning into people who have been there and done that along the way. I think the beauty of, you know, meeting somebody like you that early on at the Series A pre-launch and kind of given what we do at NEA, I also knew like, because that's the hardest part of my job, like when I know I want to work with somebody, I love when they come back and prove me wrong. And so, you know, we met during the Series A. You basically said, these are three instructors that I haven't signed yet, that I haven't shot classes for, that I'm going to do it. And then, you know, we caught up sort of periodically throughout that time period. And then at the Series B, you would come back, you would sign those instructors, you had shot those classes, you had launched. And out of the gates, you know, things were really humming. When you kind of look back at that time period between the Series A and the Series B and thinking about product launch, were you expecting that amount of success out of the gates? Like, just kind of walk me through that piece. So we ended up launching with three classes live and then two classes on, like, wait list. So the three classes live were Dustin Hoffman, Serena Williams, and James Patterson with Usher and Annie Leibovitz on wait list because we wanted a mix that would also show we're not in one category, right? We thought that was a really interesting mix of folks. So we said, okay, we get a big PR firm to help. And I had built up in my head that the day we launched was going to be a huge day, like 10 X average day, right? What would be afterwards. And so we launched our first customer. Like we like launched at like 2 AM in the morning. My first customer, our first customer was my mom Thanks, mom. I didn't even know she was doing that. So that was so sweet of her. And the team's all there late at night. And we launch and I think sales, I'm trying to remember, but order magnitude of like $10,000. And I'm like, if it's $10,000 and I expected this day to be 10x, right? Because like you're getting press, buzz. That means like tomorrow's going to be like $1,000. And In some businesses, that could be amazing, great, but we have expensive production costs, right? Like we've got to do more than that to actually sell things, right? And so if, you know, you're thinking about 10,000 bucks, right? We're talking about roughly just so we order 100 people had signed up that day, right? Roughly what order map two we're talking about, right? 100 people. With all that press, all the ads we're doing with these names, these instructors all tweeted about us and posted on Facebook. And you're like, I am in trouble. Mm -hmm. And I went home that night and uh, I actually cried. I actually cried. And I'm not a cracker. And I called my, my mom and dad and I was like, I am screwed. I got some of the biggest names on the planet. I got more in the pipeline. I've committed to them. I promise them this is going to be a big thing. 
and I just not only like screwed with the team, with investors, with these people who like I don't want to have a bad reputation with either, right? Like I, I don't like I don't come from this world, but that feels like the wrong people to think that you are you are not good at this. And so I remember my parents' advice was like, uh, I asked them, "What do I come tomorrow back in the office? Like, well, how do I do this?" And they're like, y- "You fake it until you make it, <laughs> and like you got to have strength until you fig until you figure out what you're going to do." So I went, in, you know, trying to have a positive upbeat attitude. And I remember um, I saw a grin on our head of paid marketing, Reed is his name. And so I was like, tell me what's going on. And he's like nodding his head with a big smile. I'm like, why are you smiling? He's like, this is going to be a big business. And I'm like, sorry, what? And he's like, have you seen the CACs I'm able to get? I can scale this thing huge. And you're like, all of a sudden you go from like dire darkness to like, wait, what? And I think that's how I summarize like that first stage. Like you just, I mean, everybody talks about the ups and downs, but like you don't know when the downs are going to be. You don't know when the ups are going to be, but it can change like that. Yeah. And then what happened was the next day was a little bit above like the first day. And then the next day was like just around there and it kept like increasing. You're like, oh, if the sales curve is going up, this might actually work. I mean, my heart starts pounding just hearing that story. There are so many ups and downs that that you face in the company building journey. Like, how do you deal with those on a day to day basis? Yeah, I mean, I think same as every other founder, like you get really highs and then you get really lows and it's become easier as my support network has grown. It's very different being a founder in Latin America than in Silicon Valley, where it's like even access to talent is just easier there. So Now that I have more friends that are founders that have started companies that have gone through the same things that I'm going, it's become easier because I have people to talk to and like get advice from. But I would say the complicated thing is your company like is growing exponentially, right? So if you're doing your job, you're growing like 2x every like four to six months. So that means the challenge is like 2x bigger every four to six months. And if that's the case, your emotional intelligence and your skills as a founder need to be scaling at that same speed. Because what happens is like, there's always a delta between, like imagine a graph where it's like the big challenge, you know, how hard things are, and like exponentially. And then my emotional intelligence and my skills. And it's also exponential. There's a delta between those two lines that is always constant (laughs) with the skills and emotional intelligence that I have now, the challenges I had last year, I would master it. But like, I don't have those challenges. I have the challenges of this year. So this year, I'm still at the Delta. Like there's a difference between what I know and what I need to know. So that's the challenge. It's like, if you ever kind of like slow down and stop developing your emotional intelligence and your skills, you can get behind really fast. So that's what's really overwhelming. But I've solved it in an efficient way, which is with being surrounded with the people who have done it. And I've been very good at that. Like, you know, I have people from Netflix and Pinterest and Audible and like the best companies that went through these exact challenges. They're my investors or my advisors or like Casey, for example, he's on our board. So... Now, whenever I have a challenge, like I know someone from my network has gone through it and can tell me how to figure it out. Kind of thinking about advice for other founders that are earlier on in that journey that are, you know, maybe at that Series A or Series B phase. Any advice in kind of the fundraising process and deciding on which investors to work with? This is advice that I wish I had had and some of it I had and some of it I had learned the hard way. Number one is find somebody who's a couple stages ahead of you and ask them for advice. Like there's art to this, there's skill to the raise, and it changes all the time. So getting somebody who's maybe a year to two years ahead of you in whatever phase you're at is really going to help because things change in the market and things like that. I think it is easier to get a divorce than it is to get somebody off your board. So you have to choose this person and this fund that you're going to work with for five years, for 10 years, for 15 years, whatever it is. So for me, I had to think about what do I care about? And I care about somebody that I'm going to want to work with. 
and somebody who I know we're going to have some amazing days. I know we're going to have some hard days, but that through all that, I'm going to want to work with. So, you know, the biggest way I found that out, I asked you for a bunch of your entrepreneurs. I asked them for ideas of entrepreneurs. And for me, the trick was figuring out the entrepreneurs or the companies of yours that failed, right? Because to me, always, if a company does well, okay, so the investor is great. You're like, yeah, okay, if everything's going well, I'd, I'd be good too. You want to know what happens when a company doesn't do well. And what was amazing to me, Rick, is I talked to entrepreneurs or companies of yours and you know, a few that hadn't done well, right? And they were like, I would take Rick's money again any day. Like I would work with him any day. And he was fantastic. And they're, you know, sometimes they get emotional. It was a tough process for them. It's tough to remember them. But they're like, Rick through all that was there with me. And I was like, that's the type of guy I want. <laughs> and so it's almost the references from the folks that hadn't gone as well meant more to me than the ones that had, if that makes any sense. No, absolutely. And from the investor standpoint, what I always believe and know is there's also this bond between founders, even if they don't know each other, that because they're on that same journey, they'll always be looking out for each other and be 100% you know, transparent with each other. And that's what I think about a lot as an investor and, and sort of when I'm working with people. So I think that's great advice. Pamela, what drives or excites you as you think about the future of Beak? For me, it's all about the mission. Like, I know in the future, we will see in Latin America things that didn't happen in the past, like winning the Olympics or winning the World Cup or going to space. Those are stories that don't happen in Latin America because we don't have an American dream like you do in the U.S. So BIC is building the Latin American dream for Latinos through stories in their local language. And I just know it's going to be like something that will generate a change in our region. Pamela, thank you so much for joining us today. It's just been thrilling to have you and a real inspiration to hear the story of Beak so far. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here, and I hope this inspires all our founders to build great things with purpose. It's been awesome partnering with you so far. Same, same, <laughs> same, same. There's still a lot more to go. Thank you. Thank you. always inspiring to hear a founder share their journey. It's inspiring and instructive to hear a founder explain how they overcame obstacles and evolved with their businesses to serve a community or a cause that's deeply important to them. The candor and conviction with which these founders discuss company building offers any founder both guiding principles and specific advice that they can take away and apply in their own journey. I'd like to thank Pamela, David, and Rick for sharing their incredible stories with us. It's an honor to hear about their journeys and learn from their experience. I hope you learned a lot too. Founder Forward is a production from NEA made in partnership with Frequency Media. From NEA, I'm your host and executive producer, Kate Barrett, with support from Ashley Mitchell, Erica Sunken, and Shanna Hendricks. From Frequency Media, Michelle Corey is our executive producer, Ina Garkusha is our supervising producer, Jordan Rizzieri is our producer, and Catherine Devine and Emily Krumberger are our associate producers. Our mixer and sound designer is Claire Bidigari curtis with dialogue editing by Sydney Evans. For more on NEA, visit NEA.com. You can subscribe to Founder Forward on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever you get your favorite podcasts.